So um, I'm going to talk today about um, a couple of enzyme families, but really the, the linking um, fact here is, is my um, desire to actually not only go for enzyme discovery, but right through to enzyme design. Now, uh, John actually nicely introduced the fact that there's now almost 110 million sequences deposited in the, in the databases. And this number is just mind-boggling. And I really think that the dealing with this kind of volume of data and volume of sequence data is one of the biggest challenges in modern biology, but also one of the greatest opportunities. So if we take, uh, go from sequences to actually look at enzyme-catalyzed reactions, uh, in the EC database of the, the number of uh, enzyme catalyzed reactions that have been clarified, there's a little under 6,000 uh, catalyzed reactions that are there. And this discrepancy between like 110 million sequences down to 6,000-ish reactions really tells us about the, the gap in our knowledge here and how many more functions are likely to be discovered and that, that are out there that we don't yet know. If we then look a little bit on a finer scale, we can see in the structural database, so the CATH database, there's actually only about 14,000 folds, so structural folds. So how can we actually achieve this amount of enzyme diversity and reactions that are present? And that's through fold repurposing. So if we look at a range of modern superfamilies, these are clusters of, of sequences that share a common ancestor, a, catalytic, a fold, and catalytic machinery. You can see that in many of these uh, common superfamilies, um, such as the aminohydrolase um, family, this fold can actually support all of the different uh, classes of the enzyme, enzyme commission. So from oxidoreductase enzyme uh, activities right through to ligase enzymes. And there was a, a really nice piece of work by Christine Arengo's lab um, that looked at the evolu evolutionary transitions that can occur. So she took uh, 379, sorry, Nick Furnham in her lab, uh, took 379 superfamilies and did the phylogenetic analysis to see what were the evolutionary transitions that happened in the superfamily. So what were the transitions between the different um, EC classes? And about 80% of those, there was about 4,000, I think, overall different transitions that had happened within these superfamilies. And about 80% happened within the same EC class, and that's, that's understandable. But interestingly here is almost every single other transition was possible. So in a single fold, in an evolutionary um, distinct superfamily, you can get transitions between almost every different EC class. And that really tells us that the evolution of enzymes is not, uh, so within a catalytic fold or a structural fold, you're really not that constrained. You get, can go from very, very different reactions. And that, for me, is one of the key points of my research program and the wider questions of the Tokariki Lab um, over in British Columbia. And that's how does evolution actually create new function? In order to understand that, you, if you're looking at a superfamily um, or even in a grander scale in the biosphere, what functions are present? What's out there? And as I alluded to earlier, we, we really only know the tip of the iceberg of enzyme functions that are available. And if we're looking at enzyme functions, for me, I'm also interested in what promiscuous activities are present. And so not only this is not the native reaction of a particular enzyme, but the underlying um, low-level activities that enzymes can also, also catalyze. And this leads on from work of some of the, the leading evolutionary biologists. So Jensen, back in the, the late 1970s, uh, postulated the idea that the primitive enzymes, so enzyme ancestors, are promiscuous. They were generalists that could actually, didn't have specific um, uh, activities per se. And then uh, leading on from that, Dan Hirschlag, Danny Torfik, um, and Shelley Copley have also really expanded these ideas about how almost all enzymes are promiscuous and how this is really important not only to understand the evolution of history of how enzymes have evolved and linkers back towards um, what perhaps were maybe the ancestral functions, but also they tell us a lot about how the evolutionary potential of different enzymes. And so the first superfamily that we looked at um, in the Tokariki lab was the uh, metallobetalactamase fold. It's a multifunctional family, um, and really the, when you're starting to look at sequences um, or functional diversity within a superfamily, you're looking at the sequence structure function relationships. 
So within the MBL fold, there's about 35,000, just under 35,000 different sequences. They all share a common structure, so the alpha, beta, beta, alpha fold, they bind either one or two metals within the active site. And there's a wide range of functional activities found. So there's over 24 different uh, EC, EC um, catalyzed reactions, and they range from, um, they're all hydrolytic reactions, but they range from the, uh, so beta lactamase, um, this is the breakdown of uh, antibiotics such as penicillin, um, this is that, that reaction, to dehalogenation. Um, this is the um, hydrolysis of uh, homoserolactone, so important for quorum um, sensing. And there's also the phosphotriesterase reaction. And this is um, paroxin here, which is a organophosphate, so a pesticide that's only recently been um, uh, present um, within the environment. Um, but this is an example of a fold that's actually recently evolved to actually break down a modern day compound. So the question here, if we're starting to ask questions about uh, enzyme function, enzyme evolution, is how can we actually visualize the sequence space and the functional diversity in these large enzyme superfamilies? And John's stolen my thunder a little bit here about how to answer this question. But we use uh, sequence similarity networks, and I collaborate with uh, Patsy Babbitt and a postdoctoral um, researcher in her lab, IL, and looking at sequence similarity networks. So here, as uh, John alluded to, everyone's very used to um, phylogenetic analysis uh, where you have a multiple sequence alignment to give you information. But this is really not possible for very large, well, it can be possible, but it's very complicated for very large enzyme superfamilies. So what we can do is actually take a collection of sequences and then do a pairwise similarity. So this is taking every single sequence and comparing it and in pairwise fashion to every single other sequence within the superfamily. And then you end up with a matrix of all of the different uh, similarity values. You can then that take, take that matrix and use it as an input for, um, to generate networks in the program Cytoscape that John talked about too. So if you set this, uh, the threshold of similarity that you want to look at at a very low level, at a permissive, permissive threshold, you can see that all of the sequences in this matrix, so I'm still, I have all of the, um, the different values still present when I have this low threshold, and all of my sequences are connected in this, this hairball. Uh, this is interesting, but not particularly informative to try and deduce function. So if we then increase the threshold that we're looking at, you can see I'm now only some of the, in, some of the pairwise similarities make that threshold, and therefore the clustering becomes more distinct that's then present if you go to a very stringent threshold and you start to see different clusters occur because you're only uh, selecting some of these pairwise similarities within the matrix. And so this is the, the type of tools we're using to then interrogate big multifunctional families. And going back to these key questions, what I really want to know is what uh, activities are present um, and also how they, how they emerged. And the early work in our laboratory was on the metallobetalactamase fold. Um, and this was done by Florian Bayer, who has uh, recently finished his PhD. And so this is a sequence similarity network of the metallobetalactamase fold. And here you can see at this particular threshold the separation of different activities. We have betalactamases up here. This is the uh, phosphotriesterases that can break down parathion, uh, and lactinases here. And what Florian did is actually took uh, 24 different enzymes and assayed the catalytic activity over 10 different functions. And here you can see the, um, the matrix that uh, is the output here. And the crosses indicate the native function or our hypothesized native function. And the colors in the underlying matrix represent the enzyme activity. So you can see here we assaying right across the superfamily we not only can see the native activity, but also the promiscuous activities that are, that are underlying, that are present. And what we did in a paper that we put out last year is actually take all of these different uh, activities and then use them to create a different type of network about functional connectivity. So I wanted to look at what was the functional connectivity between all of these different clusters. So here in a, in a similar way, if we have so enzyme one, two, and three, and this is function ABC here, you can see that there is, uh, so 
Enzyme 2, for instance, can only uh, catalyse function B. Enzyme A can actually, so enzyme 1 can catalyse function A and function C. And we can use this information to create a functional connectivity network. And so here we have the, the functions A, function C, and the different enzymes have connections if they can catalyse both functions. And this was the, the matrix we used to actually establish the, the different promiscuity, so the functional landscape of the metallobetalactamase fold. And so here you can see there are some functions that are, um, so some enzymes that are highly connected with different functions and uh, some functions that are, are very distinct. So there's only one single enzyme that can actually catalyze that function. And that really is the, the basis of starting to probe uh, questions and actually develop hypotheses. As John alluded to earlier, the sequence similarity networks don't have evolutionary uh, information in, in their generation, but they are a very, very important tool for, to help us develop evolutionary questions and hypotheses about how the enzymes can evolve or how evolution has happened within a superfamily and also give us clues about the uh, potential and actually the potential of how um, evolution could happen in the future. And as I said, this goes back to the key question I, I outlined earlier and my an underlying aim of, of the research program and my, the research going forward is always to understand how evolution can create new function. And for me, that's uh, really, it's fundamental not only uh, to give us a lot of clues about how, how enzymes have evolved and really improve our, our fundamental understanding, but this is also really important if we want to take enzymes and evolve them for biomedicine, for biotech, and so actually understanding these, um, the, the details behind enzyme evolution will really help us in the future. For me, a lot of work in my early career was looking at flavoenzymes. So these are a very diverse uh, group of, of proteins that bind uh, flavo, um, flavin cofactors, and they're involved in a huge range of biological functions, um, a huge range of catalysis because of the essential chemical flexibility that the, the flavin um, will endow, uh, and also for, for many biotech reasons. And it was uh, the early work and work that I did in my postdoc was really focusing on some of the biotech applications. And I was working on a particular fold, the nitroreductase fold in my postdoc. Um, and when I first started my work, there were really um, all of the papers in the nitroreductase superfamily would always outline the fact that there was uh, hypothe hypothesized to be two different types of nitroreductases. This was really a historical thing because the people have been working on nitroductases for a very long time. And these enzymes are dimeric. I've shown here um, the two dimers in the, the grey and the green. And they bind flavin typically right at the, the dimeric super, um, interface. And they catalyse uh, typical redox reactions. So you have an oxidative half reaction where an electron donor would uh, donate electrons to the, to the FMN. And then a downstream reductive reaction where the flavin donates electrons to an electron acceptor. And this is how, for instance, um, a lot of common nitro um, imidazole antibiotics work. So common antibiotics like metronidazole are activated through oxidoreduction reduction reactions, where it's typically a um, in nicotinamide cofactor, NADH, NADPH, that will donate electrons. And then the electron acceptor, the very end of the reaction, is uh, then, such as metronidazole, and then but I just spoke about, is then reduced and activated. So uh, the work, early work that I did was on these enzymes and actually evolving them specifically towards cancer gene therapy. And I worked very uh, specifically with this, uh, one of the enzymes in E. coli, nitroductase NFSA. But what I really wanted to know, and after I moved to Vancouver, was actually what was the true diversity um, in the biosphere of these enzymes? And as I said, all of the early work uh, within or focusing on nitroductase enzymes were always uh, hypothesizing that there was type A or NFSA type, NFSB type. And if anyone found a sequence or had started to look at a sequence that was slightly different, it would always just be called an outlier, so an outlier sequence. But if you look at the PFAM database, you would then see that there's over 20,000 different sequences attributed to the fold. And so really I wanted to understand what was the diversity out there and uh, wanted to look at all of the different functions that are potentially there as well. 
And so for that, uh, if we imagine a typical catalytic landscape, um, people had already had generally looked at only uh, two different sort of peaks of functional activity. And I wanted to see what the true actual landscape, all of the different peaks that were possible that were out there. So the key questions that we looked at here was, again, looking at what catalytic activities were, were there, how the fold could actually support all of these different catalytic reactions, and then going from there, how did these functions emerge? What was the evolution that actually supported this? So if you look at a, a sequence similarity network of the nitroductase fold, you can see immediately that the, there's a lot of very complex and diverse sequence relationships that was there. If I then colour this network by the presence of the two typical nitroductase types, this is NFSA and NFSB. So immediately you can see that there's a whole lot more diversity than anyone actually was understanding at that time about the nitroductase superfamily. And the other interesting thing here was there was this hub um, hub spoke topology of the network, where all of these outlying different groups appeared to be uh, connected, had sequence similarity to this uh, large group of sequences in the middle that we, for obvious reasons, called the hub. So if we then go back and start probing the different diversity, and this is one of, I think, the true utilities of sequence similarity networks. So you have the information of sequence similarity, and then you can start overlaying information about function, about taxonomy, and you really can start to understand the different attributes um, of, the, of the network and of the superfamily. So if I take the sequence similarity network and colour by sequence length, this is one of the first things that I often do within, if I'm looking at a uh, superfamily, and you can see here that there are some, some clusters that are significantly larger, so this is between, this is coloured between 320 and 400 amino acids. Um, and the hub in particular is interesting because it's quite small. So these group of sequences that are right in the middle and right at the base sort of uh, all connected were with small, um, typically only 150 to 180 amino acids. You can then take the network and colour by taxonomy. So here I have coloured um, by um, typical taxa. And again, you can see some groups. This is uh, almost a eukaryotic group of sequences up here. Um, this is another cluster that's uh, particularly common in uh, actinomyces. Um, and again, here in the hub, also very interesting to us because it's had a whole very wide, very phylogenetically diverse group of sequences. So within this hub, so hub group, we had not only um, bacterial, but also archaeal, um, and eukaryotic sequences, so it had a very phylogenic, um, interesting uh, phylogeny within the hub. Our next step was then trying to assign functions. And so, as I said earlier, we have the NFSA and NFSB. These enzymes are thought to catalyse typical oxidoreduction reactions. But then, going through the different subgroups, we can then look at other functions that were present. The blue B is a very interesting subgroup to me because rather than using the flavin um, in typical redox catalysis, the blue B group of enzymes actually bind flavin and then proceed to break it apart. So these are flavin fragmentation enzymes. And so they take the flavin and then using oxygen, create dimethylbenzamide, which is actually the lower ligand of vitamin B12. So this is part of the aerobic vitamin B12 biosynthesis pathway. Another really interesting group of enzymes is the IYD dehalogenases. So all of us have this particular subgroup of, uh, uh, within our bodies, and this is involved in thyroid signaling or recycling of the iodine that's really important for um, thyroid hormones. So this uh, enzyme is responsible for taking the iodine from uh, iodinated tyrosines and recirculating it for use um, within the thyroid. So using this type of approach, we can then assign a putative function to all 12 different subgroups of the superfamily, have at least one experimentally um, verified uh, function. And so that then led uh, me to my next question I wanted to ask this data, is how the structural fold can actually start to support these diverse functions. And one of the great things here, and it's actually, for anyone working with undergrad students, the flavin enzymes are wonderful for purification. They're generally pretty soluble and they're bright yellow. So when you purify them, they're very easy to follow. You can literally see your protein coming off the column. Um, and this has actually helped a lot of uh, people and uh, uh, nitroductase is often used um, in structural consortiums. And so we have a huge structural coverage of the superfamily. 
So we have over 98 structures. Um, so we have structures from 16 of the 24 different um, subgroups of the superfamily. And that allows us to actually overlay all of the structural information and then come up with what we see as the minimal ephemian binding scaffold, the common scaffold of the whole superfamily. And that then allows us to dig a little deeper and look at the, the key catalytic, the key functional residues that are within the fold. Um, and you can see here, so this is the flavin bound right at the dimeric interface. And we have residues such as the, um, what called the phosphate tail residue, so involved in coordinating the phosphate tail. And um, a residue up here that's very interesting, it's, sort of, it's quite far above the flavin, but um, from my early work when we're evolving enzymes toward, evolving the nitroductase enzymes towards the cancer therapies, I knew that this loop up here was actually very important for, um, for catalysis and for um, substrate recognition. Using this type of information, what we're then able to do is do active site profiling across the whole superfamily. So doing, using a structural modelling um, approach, we actually took this information of the key minimal um, scaffold and applied that across the whole superfamily. And we're then able to take a, the network here. And this is showing the network actually, this network is now coloured um, by the presence of the, a residue at a specific point within the, the structure. And so this is um, the network here coloured by the residue that occurs uh, coordinating the phosphate tail. And again, this is one of the, I really like to highlight this to people as about the utilities of networks, because you can, now here we're looking at it on a global scale, this is 24,000 sequences, and coloured by what residue is occurring on a very high resolution um, point, what residue is occurring at a particular point in the structure. And this is very important, obviously, going forward towards probing different functions and different catalytic reactions. And so, as you can see here with the phosphate tail, coordinating flavin is a very, um, it's a key attribute of the whole superfamily, and it's shared across almost all of the, of the superfamily sequences um, that I've shown here. If we look at other residues, such as the re-loop residue that I alluded to earlier, I knew from my earlier research this was more important for substrate recognition, you can then see that we have much more diversity about the, the residue occurring at this point in, um, within the, the alignment. So you can see some subgroups have very specific uh, different residues that are occurring. But interesting here as well, we go back to the hub, and the hub actually has many different um, residues that occur at this point. So it's uh, a, a big range of different residues that are occurring. And talking again a bit more about the hub, as we can see, the hub structures, when we go back and look at them as well, they're, as I alluded to before, they're small and they actually very closely resemble the minimal binding scaffold that we um, ha have found for the whole superfamily. So this is an example of a hub subgroup structure and they really do, they don't have a lot of different loops or different modifications that are happening um, to many, some of the other enzymes. And looking at those different uh, loops and modifications that occur throughout the superfamily, we could then see that there were three hotspots occurring. So there's three key points within the structure where different insertions were happen. We have we call them uh, extension one, two, and three. And although the point of the structural variation was conserved, there was very different um, insertions, very different structural kind of tailoring or um, elaborations that happen. And you can see that most clearly with the extension that's happening um, at the top here, at the very top of the dimerization helix, where you can see the dehalogenases here have a very different insertion happening to some of these other, other subgroups, other functional subgroups within the superfamily. And we took this, uh, this finding of the different hotspots and looked a little deeper. And we could then see that we had fixation of key residues within these, um, these structural loops and, and tailoring, um, tailoring modifications that were happening. So the dehalogenation subgroup that I spoke about earlier, if we look at the two different extensions happening to the structural scaffold, they actually harbour very important uh, functional residues for the halogenation. And so although within the subgroup that there's not a high conservation across the whole, the loops themselves, the key functional residues were highly conserved. As you can see, very high conservation rates within these, um, within these points. We then uh, wanted to look at how these functions emerged. And so 
The hub was always very interesting to us because we knew that they were short sequences, phylogenetically diverse, minimal scaffold, and there's also diverse um, FMN binding residues there. And for me, that, that was really indicating towards um, re evolutionary hypotheses. Are these uh, indicative of how the evolution of the superfamily has, has proceeded? But as John alluded to, you can't, you've got to be very careful taking evolutionary questions from, or evolutionary hypotheses from networks because it's pairwise similarity. There is no underlying alignment per se for what's going on. So we took all 24,000 sequences and I, I throw this up very casually. This took an awful lot of work. This is a phylogenetic tree of 24,000 different sequences, but colored by the same subgroups that we have here in the network. And you can see how well this, uh, things have been paralleled. It's not exact, but there's, there's nice parallels between the different information here. The hub are actually very short branching um, sequences. But interesting as well, very short, these hub sequences actually fall in these pre-branching um, groups in the phylogenetic tree as well. And so that led us to, the, to really establish a hypothesis for evolution in the superfamily, whereas we feel that the hub is ancestral-like um, for reasons that we are now testing. We think that they are like a molecular a relic, per se, of what perhaps the ancestor looked at. And you can see they're deeply rooted within the superfamily. So in summary of that, we have now an understanding of some of the diversity that's there within the enzyme nitroductase family. We know that the structural fold has actually supported these functions through insertions to a minimal scaffold. And we also uh, really uh, believe that the functional divergence have occurred from ancestors that look very much like the hub. So we're starting to understand a bit more about functional divergence within the nitroductase superfamily. But along with the, and along with understanding of how the different uh, evolution has occurred towards these different uh, functions, so fixation of key residues, uh, structural insertions. But we still don't really know the true catalytic diversity that's out there. So I coloured before um, the subgroups that we know function, or we can putatively have function. Function of 10 major subgroups still remain unknown. And this actually is uh, more than a third of the superfamily we don't know the functions for. And furthermore, if you look at subgroups such as the very well-characterized NFSA subgroup, there's 37 different characterized enzymes from the subgroup that you can find in the literature, but they actually all fall within a very tight cluster of the NFSA subgroup. So even within known or well-characterized subgroups, there's still functional diversity perhaps there that we don't know about. And so to start looking at this, we, I was very lucky to receive a grant from the Joint Genome Institute in the, in the US. And we looked and synthesized uh, an enzyme library, synthesized enzyme library, that now cover the whole functional, the whole sequence diversity of the superfamily. We then screened that, first of all, using the typical substrates thought to be uh, canonical for the superfamily. And we're able to produce uh, heat maps of the typical nitro aromatic and quinone compounds that these enzymes were thought to characterize. So here we have a heat map colored by, this is uh, the first set of enzymes we tested, so 250 enzymes, different subgroups, and we have nitro aromatic and, and quinone activities here. So you can see, for instance, this is the uh, highlighting the NFSA subgroup. There's a, a very um, wide range of substrates that NFSA can actually uh, reduce or catalyze. Uh, compare that to some of the other subgroups where they appear to have a much narrower um, range. And overall we can show here that it's four key subgroups of the superfamily um, can catalyze the reactions, the nitro reduction reaction or the reaction of quinones. And we can take this information, um, for instance this is a nitro aromatic, uh, nitro furan, uh, furazolidone, we can take this information and then use it to overlay onto the networks. So this is showing how the, a very nice way, using the networks, that nitro reduction is actually predominantly localised to only four subgroups of the superfamily um, and exemplified by this particular compound. So this is colouring by red high activity, the white enzymes here I have no activity at all. And further to this is really interesting because the hub itself, at least in the assays that we've done so far, don't appear to function as a nitro reductase. So really what we're doing now is uh, taking this information and starting to probe, as we say, the, an expanded view of functional divergence in the, in the superfamily. So along with the um, 
expression and testing of uh, enzymes within the, the library and, and using uh, substrate screens. We're also using um, John's tool, using the genomic networks to try and probe different activities. And for me, as I said, I'm, also, I'm interested in how these enzymes have evolved and also their potential. So we're doing ancestral reconstruction and seeing what the, the ancestor of different subgroups and the common ancestor of, of several subgroups and also looking at the evolution of some different subgroups to see what is the potential that's still there. And so as I say, we're now beginning to understand not only the peaks of function, but the trajectories of how you can get to these different functions. And what I'm doing at present is then looking at what are the links in between these different functions that we can, we can really start to test. Um, and I, I really think that one of the best summaries of trying to um, all of the different projects that are now expanding from this work is actually a quote from Richard Feynman. He said, if I can't create it, I don't really understand it. So we have theories about how we think these enzymes have evolved and the different trajectories that are there. But until I, I really want to go back and test the ancestor and actually see what can evolve, because then I think we, we will truly start to understand the, the potential and the diversity of the superfamily. So in conclusion, I just need to thank everyone, uh, Nobu Tokariki in particular, who has let me run wild with my own research program within the umbrella of his laboratory. I have some very talented undergraduate students that, despite all of the, uh, the photos drinking coffee, they tell me they really like high throughput screening. Um, and also spoke about Florian Bayer's work. Uh, uh, he did a lot of the work on the uh, metallobetalactamase family. Um, Patsy and IL are the, the computational collaborators that are behind a lot of the early um, the networks and the sequence sim similarity networks. And also collaborating with a group over in Germany uh, doing ancestral reconstruction. Um, and Nick Arning's a master's student that's, that's been working with me recently. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Janine. Uh, I, have, I would have several questions for you, but we are running a little bit out of time. I can allow one short question from the room. I don't know, you can scream. You can <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, very interesting talk. I was just wondering, I mean, you talked about that at the very last part of your talk when you said that the hub enzymes, they don't have any nitroreductase activity. At, at least in the screening that we've done so far. Yeah, so it's a limited... Um, I understand it's a limited... But can you have any, is any speculations what they could do? I've got a few theories that we're testing at the moment. Um, they, they are active. So I have, I have shown that they can catalyze, at least at a very low level, um, just oxidase activity. Um, but I... It's a very diverse group of enzymes as well, and it's really something that it's one of the, the, the key areas that I want to look at going forward because it's, it's a very large, so there's actually almost 10% of the whole superfamily, where this is 20, I think, 2,500 um, sequences all fall within the hub. There's very few, um, very little knowledge about what they do, um, but it, it's a, a very a specific research um, area I want to go into in the future. Yeah, I'm sorry there is no time for more questions, but you will be around during yes, the conference? Absolutely. Yes, because uh, then uh, those of you who want to talk to Janine about this, this very interesting approach should absolutely do that. But now I think we have to go for coffee. And I thank you again for your talk. Thank you.